sermon today. If there are any uh, children five years or, or younger, we have um, some activities in the side room. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Abuna David and Abuna Daniel. Thank you. Um, um, I humbly uh, accepted to come out here, even though I told them it wasn't a good idea. <laughs> but um, yeah, so today, uh, so for anyone who doesn't know me, I like to kind of mix in our talks with a little bit of hymnology, a little bit of history, and spirituality as well um and i think that's kind of what the church is doing especially during these days we see it at the prime example right so to set up everything right now we're on monday right or the eve of tuesday and um monday tuesday and wednesday is a unit by itself during holy week all right um before we get into it, though, we see that when we start the Holy Week, the uh, veil, usually the veil of the altar is closed, and we're all praying on the outside. We're all on equal footing. Um, there are a couple meditations on this, mainly that under the Old Testament law, uh, sin offering was to be burnt outside of the camp so that it does not defile, the sins of the congregation doesn't defile uh, uh, or to defile the camp, right? So in a similar way, Christ had taken away the sins of the world outside of Jerusalem. Um, the church actually follows this example by celebrating all of the prayers of the Bescha out here and outside of the altar at the first section of the church. We're also focusing on some major connected themes throughout this entire week, um, and especially within these three days. So it seems that all of us right now are on equal footing out here. The priests, the deacons, the chanters, the congregation, we're all on the same level. And what is on top of us is the cross. So all our focus is on the cross. And we're all below the icon of the cross. Um, this theme is a theme of humility. Right? It brings us all down and it reminds us that we're all one church, one body, and one body of Christ and under the cross of Christ. So the point of our lives is the cross. The whole experience of Holy Week is designed to eliminate as many distractions as possible, both inside and outside of the church. So even you see ritually, a lot of things that we usually do in the church, ritual, uh, processions, symbols, incense, all of that's eliminated during this week. Because um, our focus now is mainly on scriptural readings and actually mainly this week more than any other time of the year, right? And we're meditating. The point of it is to meditate on God's words, right? So even the hymnography is designed to help us do this. Um, the Psalms are long, right? When we chant them, they're long for a reason. Um, it gives us time to ourselves to reflect, to think, to meditate. Uh, and, and this is where I'll, I'll kind of take a sidestep to even tomorrow, uh, God willing, we are going to chant uh, a very long hymn called Pekethronos. Right? And even this tune, historically, is a pharaonic tune, which uh, was sung at the time during a, the deceased of a king, the, the, the deceased king. Right? After Christian, Christianization, the tune was adapted to the psalm okay, uh, from King David. And the psalm itself, it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. And that's Psalm 45, verse 6. It's a sad tune because of its origins. And it's sung at a time, like I said, 
when a king has passed into the land of the dead, according to the Egyptian mythology. Um, so why did our church adapt this tune during the Holy Week? But before we understand that, we have to know that there's actually a sister hymn. Uh, Bekethronos has an, uh, an exact hymn called Avicinon. All right. So this one is the exact same tune, but different words from a different psalm. And the words are, his talk is smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are smoother than soothing oil. I'm sorry. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. And that's from Psalm 55, verse 21. So both hymns are sung twice during the Holy Week. Right? Bekethronos, a meditation that the church is trying to say, is Bekethronos, let's say, represents the good, and Avicinon represents evil, which Avicinon, the words are, Whose words are smoother than oil? It's reminding us of Judas and the devil. Okay. So take note then the entire week. So tomorrow we sing Bekethronos. Wednesday we sing Avicinon. And then Thursday we sing Avicinon. So it's it's kind of the meditation is that we're we're seeing the, the fight between good and evil during the entire week. We don't hear Bekethronos. Again, until when? Until the 12th hour after we open the veil, right? And we sing the hymn in front of the cross, right? That we, it symbolized that the cross conquered, right? That the fight for good conquered evil. So, again, throughout all of this, we see that the church is trying to direct our prayers, right? Um, but we have to remember something, that this is something that we should be doing daily, not one time or one week per year, right? Uh, this is a daily thing as Christians, as someone who is invested in having a relationship with Christ, right? Um, anyone who has a relationship with anyone you you don't you don't like you don't do it one week and then leave the person out for the rest of the year right of course we have to invest in our relationships right so we should be themes vigilant which again we kind of towards the end of the uh the readings today um it's starting to set up for tomorrow vigilance being focused being prepared anticipating and the main thing today is without hypocrisy and practicing true humility. So, again, while the Holy Week is focused solely on Christ's last week of life and these events, the ritual of the week is actually structurally mirroring the year-round what? What's the week actually mirroring? Jesus. We pray to Jesus, how? Daily through the Egbeya, right? The daily book of hours. And you can see the hours are divided, first, third, sixth, ninth, eleventh, right? And the gospels that are usually read during the year in the Egbeya are obviously replaced now, focused more on the last week of Christ. Um, it, no psalms are being said, but what... What are replaced with the Psalms? What's, what's, thine is the power, right? Thok tetigom, 12 thok tetigoms for the 12 Psalms of the Ikbeya hours, right? So again, this is the hallmark of the week and the church is reminding us, it's not just for the week, it's daily, right? We should be praying daily, we should be investing daily. So what's the point of all this? Is that the life of the church is not a dead remembrance of past events, right? Again and again in our prayers, and we saw it in Palm Sunday, what do we say? Today, the sayings are fulfilled. We always use the word today, right? We never say past events. They happen today for each of us, 
because we experience them in the present. So it's a living reality. And through these events, we participate in eternity. So the outside world has its own calendar, right? And its own schedule and its own celebrations. And the church's festal cycle is like, I want to think about like a parallel universe alongside this life that we're living in this world. So when we start to step into this, we get a glimpse of eternity in heaven. I think that we, we have the most example. You know, usually the church is packed during this week. This is, this is a, a very heavy services, a lot of hymns, a lot of, you know, it's, it's long, right? And you would think people would just get bored and not come. But this is the one time of the year it's packed, right? So we want that glimpse of eternity. We, we're actually enjoying it. And through this calendar, we participate and anticipate, right? The more we do this, the more we shape, and I've given talks here before and I've kind of hinted, we'll we'll review it again, about this orthodox frenema, right? This way of thinking, the way of living our lives, right? And part of anticipation then is preparation, right? So today we, during the day, we read about the, um, the, um, fig tree that Christ cursed, right? And, uh, you know, he checks the tree. There's no fruit, it's big leaves, no fruit. He curses it, goes, comes back, it's dead, right? And this reading is actually, dare I say, a little bit uncomfortable, right? It's like a little out of character for Christ, right? Uh, it m- makes us uncomfortable, but we'll, we'll meditate on that for a second. Because there's a reason why it makes us uncomfortable. But the point of it is that we don't want to be spiritually fruitless. And this sets up, again, what we said Monday through Wednesday is the whole unit is called the service of the bridegroom, right? It sets up the focus that Christ is the bridegroom and we are, as the church, his bride, right? Um So now with the fig tree, actually today or this whole week, there's a lot of trees, (laughs) a lot of themes of trees, right? There's the fig tree. um, There's the tree of the cross, right? And we also see in the prophecies, the tree of knowledge, of knowledge of good and evil, right? Of Adam and Eve. So we see in the first hour prophecy today on Monday, a focus on Adam and Eve and their creation and ultimately their decision to choose sin and break their relationship from God. Um, And they were cast out of the garden of Eden. We see that in the ninth hour of prophecy as evil cannot coexist with good, right? So afterwards in the story, we see that Adam and Eve covered themselves with fig tree leaves, right? They were realizing after they chose, they realized that they were naked. They were no longer innocent. And realizing their sin, they tried to what? Cover it up with those leaves, right? Here with this story, Christ is reminding us that by by cursing the fig tree, that we shouldn't cover our sins, right? With Uh, what we call the cloak of hypocrisy in Matthew chapter seven, verses three through five. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So the church is reminding us that we should not think of this week as another, uh, again, forgive me, this is just for talking for even for myself, as an appearance of worship, right? That we shouldn't be worried about our appearance, but worried about what, what's going on inside, okay? So the fig tree leaves themselves, they're, they have, you know, they're 
big leaves. They're eight inches, usually up to eight inches, and there's three to five lobes on it. Um, usually the presence of leaves on a fig tree means there should be fruit behind them, okay? So with this tree, the presence of leaves showed a false promise of inward fruit. So the external appearance makes it as if there are some spiritual fruits, but sadly there's nothing. So again, I think we hinted at this too when we were talking about fasting, right? It's not all about the ritualistic, uh, you know, practices and, you know, nitty gritties and all that but be careful don't, don't skew the other way either you know they'll be like oh yeah it's whatever it's okay <laughs> i'm ritually pure you know it's 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 a balance right so if we lack faith and we lack inner holiness inner love then we have no fruit right uh, basic practical examples right like uh, look at someone oh like um get a mom who's my son never confesses, never goes to confession, you know, and then usually, well, do you confess? <laughs> you know, uh, something to think about, right? Or if I'm arguing with my spouse about respect, yet in my argument, I am disrespecting, right? Um, these are some of the things I want us to meditate on. When we read this story and we say, oh, this is making us uncomfortable, right? So because the trees gave a false promise of fruits, Christ rebuked the tree. So something to think about for all of us is when we are in positions of power, like if we're teachers, parents, um, Sunday school servants, we, we must always primarily focus internally right because by our internal character we can then externally influence and teach not just by words okay so incidentally what happens in the same day on monday christ enters the temple right and what happens then he finds the ultimate act of hypocrisy like people are buying selling for themselves. No one's there to actually pray, right? So instead of a focus on prayer, there's a focus on self-gain. So self-gain is opposite of humility. Another theme to think about with the fig tree is one to illustrate uh, preparation which is a main theme about tomorrow. So I won't get into it. I'm just trying to lead us into tomorrow, hopefully. Um, the, the Jews used to use the fig trees to gauge when summer was coming, right? So, um, you know, the bigger they are and, and the fruits, then, then they know that the season of summer is coming. So the season of summer is representing the last days. And actually, we saw this in the 11th hour, you know, watch, right? Um, and as the last days are approaching us, we should be concerned with spiritual fruits to be provided, right? So our objective this evening is to get ready. So how do we get ready? The main thing and one part, I guess, is to combat, combat, excuse me, hypocrisy. And with that, it's a domino effect, right? If we do this internally, it'll resonate through all other aspects of our lives. So how do we combat hypocrisy for ourselves? What is the root of hypocrisy? Is pride, right? In essence, we are combating our pride, right? I'm not, and I, I, I forgive me, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, you're a hypocrite. <laughs> Although like we, we saw the, uh, Christ even calling out the Pharisees, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, right? The idea, though, is to just focus on inner pride, right? The root of hypocrisy. Okay, how? Is through wisdom, right? And again, the church is beautiful in how it's organized the readings. Because with the prophecies, we have 
a lot of prophecies on wisdom, right? During the week, the church has read many passages on wisdom. Each time we open the scriptures, we ask God to do what? To grant us wisdom, right? In wisdom, let us attend to the Holy Gospel, right? And that's a reminder. Every time we read the scripture, we open, and we say in wisdom, right? The readings today had passages from Wisdom of Solomon, Wisdom of Sirach, and the, Pro, uh, the Book of Proverbs. And in the Old Testament, even the word wisdom appears over 300 times, right? So any reference in the Old Testament of wisdom refers to Christ, right? And what the church is reminding us is that we should not be relying on human reasoning, our own deductions, but we should be subjecting to God's wisdom. Our pursuit of wisdom was incorrect, and we saw through Adam and Eve, right? Um, the exposition, anyone who attended today, the exposition of the ninth hour of Monday is really beautiful, right? Um, and it's, a, it's sectional. There's a lot of sections, and we ask you, oh God, have mercy on us, right? Um, but there's one part that says, then God said, behold, Adam became as one of us discerns between the right and the evil. And even after that, he chose out of his own free will to eat of the fruit, right? And it was a decision based on human reliance. So instead, we should trust in what? The foolishness, as St. Paul says, the foolishness of the cross, because that's the ultimate demonstration of love and wisdom. And that's the true tree of life, right? So St. Paul explains this beautifully to the Corinthians uh, in his first letter. The Corinthians were a rowdy church. Actually, we should thank the Corinthians because we have a lot of the, our themes of love coming from the rowdiness, right? And also something to think about. Everything that was going on in Corinth, in, in Corinth is still going on to this day, which is encouraging, right? Because it's like, oh, you know, the people back in the day didn't have it the same as we are. It's the same themes, right? So they were talking about, oh, I'm of Apollo, so I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul, right? And he's explaining to them, no, this is not the point, right? The point is the unity of the church and the unity in Christ, not in its leaders, right? You know, I'm going to this church because this church does it this way. I'm going to this or that, right? Like the, the, the point of it is unity, right? So he's addressing wisdom versus foolishness. And they were using philosophy and wisdom, dividing the Christian faith into schools of its leaders, right? But he tells them he was meant to preach the gospel. And what's the gospel? Is the cross and the message of Christ's crucifixion, right? So he's not preaching with worldly wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of its power. And it's an important point for us to remember because God chose to show his power and salvation through the cross. And that's the last way any human thought of salvation would be achieved, right? If I were to use logic, this is not logical. But because it's not logical, it shows the wisdom of God, right? Again, simple example. If I look at the right-hand thief, logically, and I look at Judas for this week. Logically, living during that time, Judas is a follower, always with Christ, did miracles. And the right-hand thief did whatever, right? And was sentenced to death. Logically, in my head, as a human, being, oh, yeah. The right-hand thief is gone. Judas is saved, Right? But that's human wisdom. Yet God saw, through uh, Christ saw internal what was going on between the two. And by few words, the thief is the first of us, God willing, to enter into paradise, right? So wisdom cannot coexist with pride. So if Paul converted people because of his eloquence of speech, then the power of the cross would be lost. Paul explains that Isaiah foretold that people would be baffled by the wisdom of God. He challenges them 
to explain the cross by worldly manners. God wants us to come to him. Why? Because of faith, not because we're, you know, convinced. It's illogical. We should be taking human mind and setting it aside, meaning setting aside our pride. If God gave us rational arguments, we would not choose to come to him out of our own free will, right? It takes faith for us to come to him with no influence. So wisdom is not purely intellectual, but a way of life. So we need to be linking our thoughts with our actions, right? Uh, we're, we're called to acquire the mind of Christ, the understanding of God, not the mind of Jacob or not the mind of insert name here, right? We are called to acquire the mind of Christ. So St. Paul says in Romans 15, 5, he emphasizes the proper attitude which leads to correct behavior. Um, internal versus external. So, franima, which is our way of life, our orthodox thinking, it involves the mind, which we are, again, to acquire the mind of Christ, but it's not formed by rationalism, but it's linked to my behavior. St. James warns us in chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, but if you harbor bitter envy and self-seeking ambition in your hearts, do not boast or lie against the truth. This wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. When we depend on our human wisdom according to God, this is foolishness when we depend on ourselves. So how do we obtain wisdom? Through the fear of God. That's the start. And after that, we obtain spirituality. So we rely on the spirit of God, which gives us enlightenment and guidance, right? First John uh, chapter two, verse 20. But you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. When we take God out of the equation, everything is vain, vanity. When we involve God, then we rely on him. And this in turn helps us keep focused, not on ourselves, but on him. Um, we're almost done, I promise. So in Solomon, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he admits it, right? Solomon being the wisest, right? He says, whenever my eyes desire, I'm sorry, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor, and this was my reward from all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on the labor in which I had to, which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. God was absent in all his labors and joy. So therefore, he said, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. So even prayer can be practiced according to the body but not by the spirit. At the body's level, you know, we do movements, we worship, we raise hands, right? But we see in Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 13 says, they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, right? We force tears, we fake emotions, right? Sometimes to, you know, joint effort, right? Like uh, to get, to get the attention of others. Uh, it's, it's, it's something that prayer of the spirit is forgetting that the outside world exists, right? Around you, you don't feel the presence of others. That's not the point. You feel the presence of God and you focus on prayer with God. You'd be happy that you know God and you'd be happy that you invite people to God. And how do we feel true happiness? St. Paul says in first Corinthians chapter 13, you read the most infamous, famous, excuse me, reading on love, right? The chapter on love. With love, we forfeit pride, right? We live in humility rather than hypocrisy, and we focus inwardly rather than externally. And Christ shows us this ultimate sacrifice of love on the cross, right? So spirituality then is man living in God's direction, in body and spirit, moving towards the infinite. It's a journey towards eternal happiness, 
right? It's living with God and wishing for everyone else to be living with God, right? So spirituality is not really a competition. We're not competing to, to go to heaven, right? We're supposed to be bringing all of us together, right? It's loving everyone despite of dot, 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 right? Insert whatever you'd like. So the kingdom of God is large enough for everyone, right? As Christ demonstrated in his earthly ministry. So spirituality is forgetting the self and it's going out of the self to reach God. In Galatians 2, verse 20, it is not I who live, Paul says, but Christ lives in me, right? So when I'm trapped in the I, then I live according to myself. And I have a long way to go. But when the I is not the end or the means, what replaces the I? It's God. My purpose. And God is the end. And God is the means. Right? So that is spirituality and that is wisdom. And instead of saying, I'll end it this way, I love me, you X out I, I'm sorry, you X out me, <laughs> and you say, I love, period. Because God is love, period. Glory be to God forever. Amen.